Well, good morning. Welcome. Glad to see you all here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And welcome, of course, to those who are streaming us on uh, Facebook and YouTube. It's good to have you here. Uh, would you join me as we worship this morning?
Your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. What? 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we raise our voices with the countless others for generations before and for generations afterwards that sing, holy, holy, holy is your name. We've gathered here this morning in this place to magnify that great name. And it is in that great name of Jesus that we as one church say, amen. Amen. You can go ahead and take your seats. Good morning. How is everybody today? Doing good? Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about kings and kingdoms. You can see my royal throne room up there. Um, but when I was thinking about kingdom, kings and kingdoms, I started thinking about some of my favorite stories about kingdoms. Um, a few come to mind for me. Frozen, the kingdom of Arendelle. Um, Cinderella, I love the story of Cinderella. Do you guys have any favorite kingdoms out there in the audience? Any favorite? Camelot, okay. Any other favorite? What, Narnia, yes, that one came up this morning too. Any other favorite kingdoms? No? Well, anyway, what's that? God's king. God's king. Yes, we're going to talk about that today. So, in a kingdom, we have a king who um, is the ruler of that kingdom, and the role of a king is to protect the kingdom. He is also there to increase wealth and the trade of the kingdom. He takes care of the poor, he establishes order, he keeps peace, and he fights the foreign invaders that are trying to attack the kingdom and, and bring it to ruin. And because of his role, um, the kingdom has his subjects, and his subjects respect that position of his role. And um, there were several different things that they do. They might have bowed and curtsied, or um, they worked hard within the kingdom to serve the king, and they offered gifts and many different things. And so throughout history, while Frozen and Cinderella, those are imaginary kingdoms, Narnia is an imaginary kingdom, there are actual real kingdoms throughout history, all throughout the Bible, and in the world around us. And some of the kings served their kingdoms very well, while some of the kings failed miserably. And today in the study of Revelation, as we go through, um, continuing through our study of Revelation, I want to talk about my most favorite kingdom. And it was mentioned earlier, that is God's kingdom. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, it states that Jesus is the ruler of the kings on earth. Jesus is in control over every king or authority on earth. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he has been in control since the beginning of time, and he's going to continue to be in control of the future. He is sovereign. And so to understand this um, concept of sovereignty a little bit, I want you to take a look at this parade picture uh, to get a little bit of an understanding. Who has been to a parade here? Lots of people, yeah. Or maybe you've seen the Macy's Day Parade on TV around Thanksgiving time. That's a huge parade. And that's kind of the parade I want you to picture in your mind, a huge parade. And so pretend you are one of those people in the middle of the band. You can see people on your right. You can see people on your left. You can see people in front of you. You can see, like, the general area. But this is a huge parade. It stretches miles and miles and miles. And there's no way you can see at the very beginning of the parade, and you can't see at the very end of the parade, but only right there kind of in the center. And that is kind of a little bit 
like God's sovereignty. God is like the parade master. He can see the very beginning, he can see the very end, and he can see everything kind of happening all in between, and he is in control of all of that, over all of that. And so, um, so God is our, he is a perfect sovereign God, and Jesus is the perfect king. He perfectly cares for his kingdom. He is perfectly just. He establishes peace and so much more. Now, some of you, I don't know, some of you either did VBS virtually or were in person, and so um, we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the things we talked about at Vacation Bible School. We learned that there is a good kingdom and that there is a bad kingdom, and the good kingdom is ruled by God. The bad kingdom is ruled by Satan. The good kingdom is based on truth. The bad kingdom is based on lies. The good kingdom is for us. God wants what's best for us. The bad kingdom is against us. The good kingdom has promises kept. The bad kingdom breaks promises. And then the good kingdom is the kingdom of light, and the bad kingdom is the kingdom of darkness. And some news this morning is that everyone is born into the bad kingdom. Because of the decision in the garden that Adam and Eve made to disobey God and want to go their own way, because of that, we have also inherited that um, in our nature, and we are also born into the bad kingdom. But the good news is, is that God does not want us to stay there. He made a way for us to live in his good kingdom. Um, he sent us Jesus. I think we need to go a couple slides. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. He sent us Jesus, and Jesus already had a place in heaven. He was there. He's there in heaven with God, but he sent us Jesus. He came from heaven, the most perfect place to earth to be with us, and he was born. He, he was born, and it was prophesied that he would be, that he's a king, but he wasn't born like any other king. He wasn't born in a fancy cradle with lots of parties celebrating his birth. He came as a baby in a manger with animals, and it was just a very simple place. He never had a place to lay his head his whole life here on earth. He was mocked and treated not well while he was here. But King Jesus came to rescue us because we can't rescue ourselves. And we also know that because of our sin, that's something that our sin cannot be paid for by the good that we do. It's good to do good things because of what God has done for us, but we can't pay for our sin by just the good that we do. And so because of that, because Jesus was perfect, because he never sinned, and because he followed God perfectly, Jesus could be that sacrifice for us on the cross and he died for us, and he made a way that we could also be with him. And then great news is that he did not stay dead. He rose again, and he lives forever in heaven um, with God. And those of us that trust Jesus and believe in his plan for the good kingdom, we become a part of his kingdom. And our king is Jesus. He rescues us. He forgives us. He makes our wrongs right. He gives us peace. He protects us, and he secures our future. And so um, you can be a part of that good kingdom. If you have not chosen to be a part of that good kingdom, that's okay, um, because that's why we share this good news on just whenever we can. And so we, we need to admit to God that we, we can't save ourselves and that we believe and that we trust in what he's done for us on the cross, that he's our savior. And when we believe that and we ask him, to, um, to come into our lives and that we're going to follow him, we also can be a part of his good kingdom. So will you pray with me? Father, I just want to thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for each of the children here today. I thank you for their families. I thank you for each person here in this congregation. I thank you that you love us and that you made a way for us um, to be in your good kingdom, that you sent us Jesus, that he's the perfect king that he lived his life perfectly here on earth, and because of that, God, he is our Savior, and he is our King that we can follow, that we can trust, 
and that we can made right, be made right with and um, live forever in your kingdom. I pray that you would just help our ears to hear you this morning and um, guide the time together in your name. Amen. Good morning, and welcome. We're glad that you're here this morning. Special welcome to any guest, um, whether you're visiting online or you're in person this morning. Uh, if this is your first time visiting with us, we encourage you to go on our church website. You have the opportunity to fill out our welcome card online, uh, but that website also gives an opportunity for you to get to know us a little bit, and that card also helps us get to know you, so we do encourage you to do that. And then also, uh, just a number of things. Uh, again, as we always remind you, we are continuing to worship the Lord in our giving, but we're doing it all through whether our church website, uh, the Give Plus app that you can download on your phone. Uh, you can mail it into the church office, or you can drop it in the gray boxes on your way out of the sanctuary this morning. And so that's how we are going to continue to worship the Lord in that way. And then also we have Ramsey Plus, uh, which is a new program that we're offering to all of you free of charge. It's on our church website, uh, so you can check it underneath the uh, resources tab. Uh, and through that, you will have access to uh, Financial Peace University, you'll have access to Smart Money, Smart Kids, as well as Legacy Journey, and so please uh, take a moment to check that out. Uh, if you have any questions, you can please contact Becky Johnson. She would be happy to help you. And then also next week, we are moving all of our services indoors, so all of our services will be inside starting next Sunday, uh, So, and we're adding a Saturday night option for that, so Saturday night at 6 p.m., so this coming Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday morning at 8.30 and 10 a.m. Uh, registration is required for all of those services, so you can do that through our church website. There will be buttons that you can click for each service and what service you'll be attending, and so please do that. And then also our estate sale is again happening next weekend, so please take note of that. Be praying for that event, um, and they also need help for that event, so if you are able to help, please see Carla. She was the one clapping over here, okay? Um, or you can contact Janice Simonson as well. She has a sign-up sheet uh, that she is collecting names to, to help with that. And that is on Friday, Saturday, right? Yep, okay. So it's 8 to 3. Okay. Okay, so they need help setting up the tent Thursday night as well as uh, Friday and Saturday for helping with stuff. Here's the cool thing. They raised $8,500 at the last one last weekend. So, and all of that is money towards the new building. So that is, that is definitely a praise to give God for. And so with that, uh, let's continue to worship the Lord this morning as Rob brings the word. Good morning, everyone. So uh, just, a, uh, just a heads up. Now, that Bill already mentioned, but... Uh, today was the last day of outdoor service on our property and uh, yeah I know and um, we had I almost said a bumper crop <laughs> we had a bumper crowd uh, and uh, so um, all this extra space you see that you've enjoyed here all summer while the majority of the folks are up on the land it's going away next week so I uh, just want to let you know that we are having those two morning services, 8.30 and 10. You will, if you want to, this sounds so unchristian. If, if you want a particular service, you're going to have to fight for it because we are limited. And so fighting for it means getting online and registering early for that service. Once it's full, the software will simply not let you register. Then you'll have to pick one of the other services. And also something that we are excited about is we are going to, in order to accommodate uh, all the people we have to accommodate when we come back indoors, uh, we are going to go to a Saturday evening service, and uh, that is for um, just a different time, uh, a different venue, so that people who can't make it on Sunday morning or maybe are going to be away on Sunday or whatever can come on Saturday night. So we think between the three services we'll be able to get everyone who's planning to come back inside. We know there are people who still, because of COVID, are not going to come back inside, and that's okay. And everyone during this time needs to do what 
you know, they feel is right for them and uh, uh, so that they feel safe and so forth and so on. So anyway, we won't get into all that. But uh, so remember, like, this, we'll put those uh, re registration buttons up early in the week. Go back, check the website. You want the 10 o'clock service. You're going to have to fight your other brother, si Christian brothers and sisters for it, okay? So there you go. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Oh, and uh, also, by the way, while you're turning there, um, if you're not getting my emails, I sent an email out last night explaining everything that's going to happen next weekend. Go on our website, onefreechurch.org, the homepage, scroll down a little, you'll be able to sign up for my email. Uh, we're disseminating a lot of important information that way, and that's your best way to stay informed on what's going on, okay? So Revelation chapter 1. Well, as we got started last week in Revelation chapter 1, we saw how the book of Revelation was given to us. God the Father gave it to Jesus, and Jesus gave it to John, John wrote it down and sent it to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, of course, like any other book of the Bible, and especially because this one was written to the churches, it's for all churches of the whole church age, right? And so that's how we got the book of Revelation. The Father gave it to Jesus. Jesus sent it through an angel to the, uh, to, to the Apostle John. The Apostle John wrote it down and sent it to the seven churches. We also saw that the title of the book is not simply Revelation, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that is significant because it is not only revelation from Jesus, Jesus gave it to John to send to the churches, but it is revelation about Jesus. And you remember that this word revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, and we get our English word apocalypse from that, or apocalyptic, which in our uh, day and age, that sounds like it's a scary word, oh, the apocalypse, right? But that word simply means to reveal uh, or to unveil, to, um, to, to reveal something that has previously been hidden or covered. And so the book of Revelation is information that Jesus is giving to his church about things that previously were unknown. And so uh, it is new revelation, basically. And... As the title, uh, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, tells us, the whole book is about Jesus. And we need to understand this as we get started in our study of the book of Revelation. The first chapter is about who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he is like. In chapters 2 and 3, we are going to have Jesus' words to his churches. And he is going to send seven letters to seven churches that were real existing churches in that day, and he has something to say to those churches. What he has to say to those churches is just as valid and important for us today. In chapters 4 and 5, they reveal Jesus as the only one in all of creation, in all of the universe, in, in anywhere to be found, that can open the seals on this seven-sealed scroll. In fact, there's weeping in heaven because no one would come and open these seals. And Jesus comes and he's declared to be the one who is worthy to open these seals. And then chapters 6 through 18 tell us about the coming judgment on the earth in the form of the great tribulation. And in fact, that's what this seven sealed scroll, as it's, uh, as it's um, unrolled and the seals are broken, reveal. Chapter 19 describes Jesus' future return. Chapter 20 describes Jesus' future reign. And chapters 21 and 22 describe Jesus' future eternal kingdom in which we shall dwell with him forever. The entire book is about Jesus. It's all about him. And as we come to verse 5 this morning, what we see is John literally explode into a description of who Jesus is, what he has done, and that he is coming again. And this detailed section regarding Jesus and all these details about him set the stage for the rest of the book because John is establishing who Jesus is before he launches into the rest of the book describing what Jesus is going to do. So let's 
uh, continue this morning in our study, Revelation chapter 1, and I'll read verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, as the title of the message suggests, it's all about Jesus. What we see in these next uh, verses in the introduction to the book of Revelation is a description of who Jesus is and what he has done and what he is going to do. And so we're going to look at three headings this morning. And the first one is this found in verse 5. We need to know who Jesus is. And that's what John tells us here. He tells us something about the person of Jesus Christ. As he begins this letter in verse 4 with the words, Grace to you and peace from. This is a typical New Testament greeting. If you read the other New Testament epistles, you'll often find this greeting at the beginning. It's the greeting is always from God. Grace to you and peace, and in this case, from him who was and who is and who is to come, and that was a reference to the Father, and to the seven spirits, which was a reference to the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ. But instead of just stopping with Jesus Christ like he does with the Father and the Spirit, he now goes into a more detailed explanation about Jesus because this book is from Jesus and about Jesus, and so he wants us to know who the person of the book is. And in addition to telling us who Jesus is, this description also establishes the foundation and the authority for the whole rest of the book. Because Jesus is the main character of the book, and he is the main actor throughout the book, carrying out the things that we will see happening, culminating in his return and the establishing of his eternal kingdom. So who is Jesus? Well, John gives us three descriptive phrases of Jesus. The first one is this in verse 5. Jesus is the faithful witness. The faithful witness. Now think about this first part of the description. John calls Jesus the faithful witness. And think about it in relation to what we have already learned from the book of Revelation, that the, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's from him, and it's about him. He's the one sending it, and he is the author of its contents. John is telling us that the one who is giving us the information in this book is a faithful witness. That means he is giving us faithfully what is true. What we are about to read are words that are true. Because when you read the book of Revelation, if you were to just sit down and read the book of Revelation, and you have no concept of God, no concept of eternity, no concept of the Bible or anything spiritual, you might ask yourself, reading the book of Revelation, can I believe this? Can I trust this? Is this really information that I can stake my whole life on? And these are important questions in light of what Jesus will tell us in this book. Listen to some of what's in this book. Jesus is coming again on the clouds of heaven. Now, that's easy to say. But picture in your mind that someday, according to the Bible, literally the, the sky, it will be as if it were split. And Jesus is going to appear in the heavens. And we learn in Revelation 19, he's going to have uh, a host of heaven coming with him. And he's going to become, and he's going to descend to the earth. But really, when you describe it that way, you're not 
used to reading your Bible or know anything about spiritual things. That sounds bizarre. He will judge sin and sinners. He is going to bring great wrath upon the earth in the form of the great tribulation that is going to include cataclysmic events. An antichrist is coming who is going to rule the world. One world government. There's going to be a false prophet who is going to bring the whole world under the umbrella of one world religion. And if you don't worship the idol that he sets up, you will be martyred and you will not be able to function or you will not be able to function in society. Two of God's prophets are going to prophesy in the streets. They're going to be martyred and they're going to let them lay in the street dead for three and a half days. Then they're going to be raised to life. That's bizarre. He will defeat Satan. God, uh, Jesus will defeat Satan, cast him into the lake of fire, and then he's going to establish a new heaven and a new earth in which we are all going to dwell forever, those of us that know Jesus. Now, that's a really brief summary of what's in there. You read the book, you're going to come away and say, that can almost sound like science fiction. And so it's all pretty fantastic. And right at the beginning of this book, John tells us that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. These words are true. In fact, at the end of the book of Revelation in 21.5 and 22.6, we're told that the words of Jesus in this book are faithful and true. The second thing John tells us about Jesus is that he is the firstborn of the dead. And we see that in verse 5. And of course, this is a reference to his resurrection. But it's telling us more than that he rose from the dead. We know that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was put in a tomb. And on the third day, on Sunday morning, he rose again from the dead. But this doesn't simply say Jesus who rose from the dead. This says Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. And so the emphasis here on the resurrection of Jesus as the firstborn of the dead carries uh, special significance. And there are all kinds of things we can learn about this. Let me mention three this morning briefly. Number one, the resurrection proved that Jesus was who he claimed to be. We know that. John, uh, Romans chapter 1, I believe it's verse 7, says Jesus Christ declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. And we know that when Jesus was alive, he went around and he told people, I am going to be crucified and buried, and on the third day I will rise from the dead. He, he said that over and over again. And so to make that claim and then be crucified and buried and never rise would prove him to be a liar, or at least a lunatic, as C.S. Lewis says. But he rose from the dead. He showed himself not only to the 12 apostles, but to over 500 witnesses. And not only is the resurrection of Jesus attested to in the scriptures, but when you go back and you read ancient texts that are not scripture, that are simply historical texts, you find people referencing the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so John says Jesus rose from the dead and what we learn at the outset of this book, this book is from none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God Almighty Himself. We need to know that. Number two, the book of Revelation promises throughout the book a future resurrection for all those who have trusted in Christ and have since died. The Bible calls Christians dying, we, they call it, we, we fall asleep in Christ. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4. Our body goes in the grave, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. All right? The book of Revelation says that there's a day coming in which when Jesus comes, the dead in Christ will rise first, there's going to be a resurrection, and we are going to be uh, caught up to meet him in the air, and thus will shall we always be with the Lord. And, and so Jesus, as the firstborn of the dead, that title, firstborn of the dead, is more significant than he simply rose. That's significant. But there's more to it. Jesus is the firstborn, the first fruits we are to follow. And John is telling us you can be assured that what God promises in this book, that you and I have a future resurrection coming in which our bodies will be raised incorruptible when Jesus comes again, is going to happen. You can bank on it. 
Paul says the now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstborn of those who are asleep. And that's the significance of that title. One other thing, number three, during the Great Tribulation, many uh, believers are going to be persecuted to the death. Now, in some parts of our world today, believers are persecuted and they are martyred for their faith. But in this time, in this Great Tribulation, persecution and martyrdom is going to be worldwide. And so the resurrection of Jesus, along with the promise of a future resurrection for all those who trust in him, is the basis for those who, who are John's readers at the time, because they were facing persecution as well, to not fear the emperor, to not fear Rome, even though they might put them to death, but continue to trust in and give testimony to the Lord Jesus. The third thing that John mentions about Jesus is that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth in verse 5. And this points us to the sovereignty of Jesus over all those who rule on the earth with authority. Jesus is sovereign. And he is sovereign over all earthly powers. Later in Revelation 19.16, it says that Jesus is the Lord of lords and King of kings. That means he is the absolute sovereign over all earthly powers. What that means is that kings and presidents and chancellors and prime ministers and dictators and all rulers of this world, whoever they be and whatever level of power they be in, are really under the authority and the power and the reign of Jesus. Romans 13.1 reminds us that there is no authority, speaking of governmental authority, there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. The Bible is very clear that God puts rulers in power, and he removes them from power. In fact, in one passage in the Bible, it says he simply blows on them and they wither away. So when God wants someone in power uh, under his sovereignty, those are the people in place. When he doesn't, they are removed. God showed Nebuchadnezzar in a dream uh, this truth, Daniel 4.17, that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and he bestows it on whom he wishes and he sets, it, uh, he sets it over it the lowliest of men. He bestows it on whomever he wishes, the kingdoms of this world. This is all very interesting. Because of all that could be said about Jesus in these couple of verses, why choose this description, the ruler of the kings of the earth? Why point out at the beginning of, of the book of Revelation that Jesus is the ruler of all earthly rulers? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, Revelation will tell us that Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom and that he will rule over all the earth and all the universe and all of the new heavens and the earth. Well, how is he going to do that if he isn't king of kings? Because in a sense, when he comes back, what he's going to say is, uh, excuse me, men and women, but your reign is over, and I am now going to take the throne. If he isn't king of kings, if he isn't sovereign, how can he do that? But that's what Revelation tells us. He is going to come back, and he will reign. Also, John's readers, and we haven't talked a lot about this yet in, in our study of Revelation, but John's readers in about 95 AD were suffering great persecution. And so the book has a lot of practical implication for those who uh, were living at the time it was written and at the time they were reading it, as well as for us today, as well as for uh, this coming great tribulation. But John's readers were suffering under the persecution of the Roman emperor and, and this designation as the ruler of the kings of the earth is to remind them that they are not merely at the mercy of Rome, but that as other scripture tells us, they were suffering according to the will of God and that they shouldn't fear the emperor. 
Rather, they are to trust in the sovereignty of Jesus, even if it means death at the hands of Rome, which for many of them, that's exactly what it meant. Think about that. What if you and I, living today, because we name the name of Christ, were threatened to renounce Jesus and worship something else or be put to death? What would you do? What would you do? John says, don't fear the emperor. And this is a great reminder to us today in these times because we live, I mean, the world has always been bad, right? Uh, But today, particularly, there are certain things that we look at and and, and it sort of gets your blood pressure up, right? And 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 it gets you a little nervous what's going on. We have anarchy. Uh, in, in many of our cities, uh, government officials, politicians who seem to have taken leave of all their senses, uh, political divisiveness like we've never seen before, at least I don't think we have, and pure, unadulterated evil, like the killing of unborn life. And do you know, uh, abortion, let's, let's just say what it is, abortion is murder. Because it is human life. And and we have, I mentioned politicians who seem to have taken leave of their senses. There are some politicians who want to legalize abortion even within minutes after birth. It doesn't matter if they're in the womb or out of the womb. Your geographical location inside or outside the womb doesn't determine if you're human life. It's not like you're not human life one second and three seconds after delivery you're human life. It's human life from the point of conception. And it's evil to murder that innocent life. All of this permeating our culture and more, here's what we need to know. Here's what Revelation reminds us of. Jesus is watching. Jesus is still sovereign. Jesus is still on the throne. Do you think Jesus is up in heaven wringing his hands saying, Oh my goodness, look what's happening in Portland. I don't know what to do. Absolutely not. You know what Jesus is saying? In fact, we learned this in the, in, later in, in the seven letters. Yeah, I'm letting evil men act out. I'm giving them time to repent. I'm giving them time to repent. And the message of Revelation is that the nations of the world, through the exercise of unfettered wickedness, if they don't repent, they are storing up wrath for themselves, and the wrath of God will surely come upon this earth. And like the book of Revelation says, the great men of the earth, the kings, and the princes, and, 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 the, and they will cry out to the uh, mountains and the rocks to fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb because they refused to turn to God in repentance. And so, to us as believers, the message is, don't lose heart. The Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. We need to believe that when we watch the evening news. We need to believe that when we see the chaos in our country and around the world. God is on the throne. You don't have to do His worrying for Him. He's got it all under control. Number two. We are told in verses 5 and 6 to worship Jesus for what he has done. Worship Jesus for what he has done. Uh, The first three statements in verse 5 were about who Jesus is, and the next three are about what he has done. And they form the basis for this outbreak of praise that we see here uh, in the middle of the verses. Uh, You'll see it um, in verse 7. To him... Uh, who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what are we praising God for? Number one, verse five, he loves us. To him who loves us. I want you to just stop and let that sink in for a minute. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. The faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, the Lord God Almighty who rules over the universe, loves us.
listen, the world may hate you. Your friends may turn on you like rabid dogs. The culture might despise you for your values and beliefs. Your Facebook friends might spew hatred and contempt against you in a public forum. But don't ever forget this. Jesus loves you. He loves you with an unfailing, everlasting love. And nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. Secondly, what has he done? Verse 5, he released us from our sins by his blood. And this is so cool. Salvation here, as we think about our redemption, is described as having been released from our sins. I love this description here in Revelation 1.5. And this language of being released reminds us that although we were alienated from God, although we were lost, although we were under his wrath, although we were bound for hell, all those things are true, but we were more than that. We were slaves of sin. We were under sin's wicked spell. We were in bondage to sin, and we were held by its power. As one songwriter wrote, we were held in sin's dread sway. But be precisely because he loved us jesus shed his blood for us on the cross and that shed blood we're told here by john who got the message from jesus that we have been released from our sins the picture is of a prisoner of one who is shackled and bound by this thing called sin and jesus by his shed blood sets us free This very truth was the inspiration for Charles Wesley as he wrote, uh, And Can It Be, and particularly this uh, verse of that song. Listen to these words, how rich they are. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. He released us from our sins by his blood. Number three, he made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. And on that, I'm going to let Joanna's words earlier, as she uh, gave us the children's lesson, stand on that. uh, And um, know that be a kingdom. The third thing we need to know about it being all about Jesus is that we need to live in daily expectation of his coming again. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. The third thing. And final thing we learn about Jesus in this introduction to the book of Revelation is that he is coming again. And this is what the whole rest of the book is going to be about. It's going to be about the, 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 how, what the world is going to look like prior to his coming, how he's going to come, what he's going to do after he comes. But it prepares us for everything else we're going to read in this book. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. You know, the rest of the book is going to give us great detail about how to be his church while we wait for his coming. Chapters 2 and 3. What the days preceding his coming will look like, how he will come, and what he's going to do when he gets here. And in the meantime, what we learn is that we as his followers are to be watching and waiting and anticipating his coming. And ready for his coming. This is what we learn in verse 7 of Revelation chapter 1 in that verse. It is a his coming is a certain event. Behold, he is coming. Remember the one who is faithful and true told us that. He is coming. Say, oh man, it's been two thousand years and he hasn't come yet. I'm not so sure he's coming. He is coming. It is a certain event. Number two, it will be a glorious event. He is coming with the clouds, and clouds in scripture. Uh, are always a representation of God's glory. And believe me, when he comes, 
There's not going to be a person on earth who's going to miss that event because it will be more than human words could even describe. Number three, it will be a visible event. Every eye will see him. And number four, it will be a sad event for many. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn those who pierced him. You see, when he comes, those who said, I'm an atheist. Well, I don't believe that Jesus stuff. Or, well, yeah, maybe there was Jesus, but there are 10,000 other religions to believe, and they're all valid. When Jesus comes, those people are going to mourn and weep because they will see the King in His glory and know they have been wrong. The coming of Christ. Here's what we need to know as we study the book of Revelation. The coming of Christ and our future home in heaven is, and, and, and this study of the book of Revelation isn't just irrelevant, high-in-the-sky theology with no practical implications for the here and now. See, some people read the book of Revelation, and I don't know what that, I don't even understand that, let alone, you know, does it have any practical impl- implication for my life. On the contrary, I want to close with these words from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. And this is what Peter tells us is the practical implication of the study of the last days, which is basically what Revelation is about. Are you ready? Uh, 2 Peter 3, 11 through 15. Peter has just talked about uh, how Jesus is going to come and his judgment and all that, and he says this, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, all these things meaning the heaven and the earth and being burned up and God's judgment and all that, What sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the day of the uh, the coming of the day of God? Since all these things are true in the book of Revelation, what sort of people ought you to be and ought I to be in conduct and in holiness looking for and anticipating the coming of Christ? because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, here comes another practical application. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent. Put your hand to this task. Be faithful in applying yourself to this. Be found by him in peace spotless and blameless and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation. That's revelation for today. Until next week, Zach, come on up and lead us in our closing song. you stand as we sing together. I 
kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven and to your now here our hearts cry out singing holy is the Lord all glory all honor all wisdom, strength, and power, all glory, all honor, are yours alone forever. All glory, all honor, all wisdom, strength, and power, all glory, all honor, are yours alone. And let your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth. Those are the words that we will be singing as followers of Christ for eternity. That comes from Revelation 4. I can't wait to get there. You are dismissed. Thank you for joining us this morning.